Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. This month in particular is being sponsored by Eric Hervin and Lindsay Marie Trebet. If you would like to become a Patreon, get extra content, and help this show grow, you can do so at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did The Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight, I'm being joined by Mr. Timothy Renner. Hi, Tim. Hey, how you doing, Soraya? I'm all right. And uh, you uh, have a few things coming up that we're going to quickly get to, and then we're going to talk about some of your more interesting experiences you've had recently. But uh, first coming up is the Alba Twitch Fest. Yeah, October 12th. Saturday in Columbia, Pennsylvania. I went on Sasquatch Chronicles and I luckily Wes stopped me and said, I didn't give the date. He said, now when is this? (laughs) That would help, wouldn't it? it, But it's, uh, yeah, Saturday, October 12th in Columbia, Pennsylvania. Beautiful little river town. And it's a, it's a great day. It's a little paranormal festival, but uh, there's, there's, it's paranormal plus. It's also, you know, there's food vendors, there's bands playing all day long, all different kinds of music going on. And uh, we're, doing trolley tours i think they're if you want trolley tours they're not going all day long this year i think they're going for the first part of the day so you want to get there early if you want to take the trolley tour they they drive you up onto chickie's rock and you can throw apples out for the alba twitches and so forth (laughs) and uh we're doing ghost tours at night so i'll be giving one of those if if you want to go with me uh, here's a warning i've never done a ghost tour before in my life i don't know if i'm any good at it but I do talk. I talk for a living, so maybe I'm okay. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing you'll be fine. <laughs> so I will be doing the 7 o'clock tour. There's three tours, 6, 7, and 8. If you want me, you want the 7 o'clock tour. And uh, I'll be doing the, the ghost tour. We, it's along the river in Columbia, along the Susquehanna River, and up to a haunted railroad tunnel. And I'll be telling mm. stories along the way of different... Uh, sightings and so forth and chickies rock and, and around the area uh including there's a a haunting associated with that tunnel specifically so we'll be talking about all kinds of stuff with that and uh, i'll be giving a talk during the day all the paranormal talks are free so if you just want to show up and you know don't want to pay a cent for anything we got paranormal speakers on the air uh rick fisher's there and two other speakers who i'm sadly drawing a blank on right now but okay. uh all day long, there's paranormal talks. And is, um, is, it, is it like it's gonna be like it was two years ago, where it's just the whole street? This is it, we've moved it this year. It's at it's called Columbia Crossings. It's kind of like a little welcome center right on the river. It, it's oh. really really awesome. There's more parking. It's it's gonna be bigger and better than ever. The music's under or or right basically under right near the the big uh, bridge that goes across the river. So there, there's this kind of separate area for the music. Um, it's it looks like it's going to be really, really big, you know, better than ever and more parking. They have a huge parking lot down there we can use and so forth. So it's a new location this year, but better, I believe. Okay. And it is free. Everything's free. The ghost tours are ticketed. So you got to buy a ticket for those and the trolley rides are ticketed as well. You got to buy a ticket for those. Um, Anything that costs money though, the money's going to the Columbia um, historical preservation society. They're an awesome historical society. They, you know, very supportive of things like ghost tours and, and cryptid festivals and stuff, besides being just one of the better, friendlier historic societies in the area. And I deal with them all with, you know, my Bigfoot books and so forth. Uh, I think, honestly, Columbia is about the best one we have. They're, they're amazing people. Nice. And t- for people who aren't familiar, what the hell is an Alba Twitch? <laughs> so it is our version by our, I mean, uh, South Central Pennsylvania is our version of these little hairy cryptids that people see all over the country. Universally, I guess they're called little people. But uh, in New England, they they call them puckwudgies. They have Mm -hmm. different names for them all over. They're little three, four foot tall, skinny, hairy creatures that some people say, oh, they're just juvenile Bigfoot, but they're never seen with adults. 
uh, these are always seen by themselves. So, and they don't have the the, the same physiology it, it, appearance of the Bigfoot. They're not bulky. They're very skinny, very thin. And we have reports of them in the area going back to really the Susquehannock Indians. They had uh, images of them on their war shields. So they were they were here before the Europeans arrived. And Albatwitch is a German name. Of course, the you know a lot of German speakers moved to Pennsylvania. And that was a creature in Germany of a different description. But when they started seeing this this weird creature over here, they just started calling it an Albatwitch. Hmm. And it's fond of apples? Supposedly. Supposedly, it's they, they love apples. They eat apples. They've been known to uh, steal apples and throw apples at people and so forth. So for a while, people said that that, that was where the name came from. It came from Apple Snitch, but uh, that is not the case. Alba Twitch is, Alba is German for elf, and there's a German verb, entwitchen, which means to escape in a kind of gliding fashion, which actually perfectly describes the way many people describe cryptids moving. So uh, that's, that's actually the name. It's a German, German word, Alba Twitch. Hmm. All right. Have you ever had any Alba Twitch reports? I had a guy come up to me at the festival last year. I had um, appeared in the paper um, talking about it, and it went to UPI, I think, or, or AP. Somehow it, it, it got in the papers everywhere. And this guy came up to me, and he was almost shaking. He, he had his uh, teenage daughter with him. And he's, he's, he asked for me, because I was, I was the guy they talked to in the paper. Where's Tim Renner? I want to talk to him. And... Uh, he came up to me and he said, uh, I didn't know what they were called. I, and I was like, what, excuse me? He's like, I didn't know they had a name. I didn't know what I saw. He said, I saw them twice. And he was almost shaking. He was really, really shook up. Um, and he said uh, the first time he saw one, and actually where he had his encounters is pretty much within walking distance of my house. It's mm. uh, We actually get quite a few encounters in Red Lion. Uh, of all places. And uh, he said he saw it in a field behind what was then a store. It's now a, a it, well, then it was sort of a convenience store or a small grocery store. Now it's a, a different shop. It's like a, a butcher or something now. And he saw it in a field behind that. And uh, he said his brother walked right up to it. And it was, he said it, it had its eyes closed as if it were doing like the little kid thing. Like you can't see me. Cause my eyes are closed. And he said, that's the impression he got, but he said his brother walked right up to it and like got in its face. And he finally told his brother, get like, stop, run, you know, don't do that. And, uh, later on, he said, as an adult, he saw it again in another area. There's a, a junkyard nearby. It was near this junkyard where actually Lon from Phantoms and Monsters, he's taken a, a separate witness, uh, saw one in the same area, um, years before. So these are separate witnesses. They did not know each other. And again, this guy didn't even know what there was a name for what he saw, you know? And, uh, so yeah, I've, I've taken that report since, you know, the, the doing the Alba Twitch day, we get on the Alba Twitch day page, we get encounters where people will say, Hey, I, I thought I saw a baby Bigfoot. I didn't know there was a name for this thing, you know? And, and so we've gotten a few to come in that way. I'd say probably since doing the festival, we've, doubled the number of Alba Twitch witnesses that, that we've, uh, we've found. There was very, very few. There's still very few. It's a lot less frequent than Bigfoot sightings, but there's a, a, a lot of them out there, actually. Huh. That's kind of cool. So if people have sightings, they should come find you at the festival. Oh, yeah, please. Please. <laughs> and I'll be there as well. Uh, so will Gwendolyn. Um, and we're seeing who else we can get to come out as well and hang out. So find us. Yeah, yeah, we'll be hanging out all day, and you're you're doing the ghost tour, right? Yeah, I'm doing the ghost tour. Cool, cool. So if I get stumbled up, you can take over. I'll just say, and Soraya can talk, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just make stuff up because I won't know any information. <laughs> um, and then the week after, you're going to be at at the event in uh, that Adam's putting on. Yes. The Strange Realities Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. Cool. So you're going to be busy. Yeah, yeah. This is my busy time of the year. I'm I bouncing from, you know, I do the some of the horror creature feature weekend. I did one of the horror uh, cons, 
and I uh, did a Comic Con last week and Alba Twitch Day and you know any paranormal fest that comes up I try to do if it's you know if I can get there and uh, yeah I'm flying to Nashville I haven't been on a plane since before nine eleven so wow you know it's a special event. <laughs> um so let's let's talk about some of the stuff you've you've been looking into recently. You were telling me a bit about pandemonium before we started. I haven't listened to the shows yet, but uh let let's talk about what's happening there and what pandemonium is. Yeah, yeah. So this is a ghost town, it's an abandoned ghost town, and we like to point out that ghost towns in the east are not ghost towns in the west. We don't get buildings that stand up because the weather just takes them down. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They don't last. It's uh, the, the rain and, and, and so forth. It just, the, the buildings just don't last. So uh, what's left is basically piles of stones where foundations were. Um, so it's not, uh, there's not buildings there um, to, to explore other than there's a old dynamite shack, which uh, I find interesting given that the, the proximity of of uh dynamite storage areas to places like uh point pleasant and yeah uh, even uh the dynamite factor i found on toad road um which is no longer there either but in any case there's a there's an old dynamite shack there but that's the only old building that's still standing the rest are just piles of stone um completely abandoned but the town was really named pandemonium if you go back to the land warrants which we did there was uh, someone named Deal, uh, which is Allison's maiden name, who lived in York County and had a land warrant in York County for a place named Pandemonium, which we're trying to find because we feel like there's a significance. There's a reason why these places have these names. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- another Deal moved to this area in Perry County. So it's, it's north of us, about two hours and had another land warrant and named that area Pandemonium. So we're trying to find out if there's some connection and indeed where the Pandemonium in York County was, because if it ends up being someplace like Toad Road or Site 7, that would be insanely interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, in any case, so Chad, who's been on the, the, a few episodes with me recently, he kind of booked this whole thing himself and just, you know, I, I've been working on the book and and the podcast and everything else and just trying to get the book done. And, uh, he just said, look, you're, you're coming out. Stop staring at a computer screen. I we're camping <laughs> in this town pandemonium. Let's go. And it's, it's Saturday and you're staying the, and we're staying the night and I've taken care of everything. And it was awesome because I, I absolutely needed to get away. It was, it was a great thing that he did for me, but we went up there thinking like this will be one of those strange familiar historic episodes you know, where we tell the, the history of a, a town and tell some of the stories about some of the, the people that, that lived there and, and died there and so forth. And there is some ghost stories associated with the cemetery. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we'll get some EVPs or something. Maybe we'll take some recorders and, and see what we, we can get. And that was kind of what, how we thought it was going to go. Now I did bring some items with me that Tobe Johnson from St- Strangebrow had sent me with the, the purpose of, uh, leaving them out. So we've both been having these exchanges with something. With um, I've talked about it on your show. I've talked about it on my show. In Hex Hall, I was leaving things and having things left for me, uh, you know, feathers and stones and, and so forth, and having this interchange with something. And, and I don't know what it, what it was. I can't tell you what it was. I believe it's some form of spirit contact, but other than that, I, you know, and that's just gut feeling and based on reading about folklore where people have had similar instances right but tobas had the same thing in washington state and we had this idea that let's trade stuff like i'm i'll send you a box of stuff that that i feel like i've been left you send me a box of stuff that you feel like you've been left and then we'll leave those out and we'll see how that goes let's see if that stirs things up or changes activity in any way so he sent me this stuff but he did not know it's very important to establish he didn't know i was going to take it to pandemonium i was just on the way out the door and i thought oh i should take a couple of those items up there and we'll see if anything happens. And maybe if they don't, maybe I'll just bring them back. But if something happens, you know, something happens. Cool. We'll yeah. We'll see what, what goes on. So we go up there and we, we tour around. Now, this is six miles into the Tuscarora State Forest. Um, so it's basically six miles from anybody. And there was no one there. We walked all around to make sure we were alone. Uh, there were no other campers there. 
there was a cabin nearby, but no one was in the cabin. So we had the place to ourselves. Now there is some traffic that, that uh, goes through. Basically, I think the town, some town people use that as a cut through to get from one area to another, but there were no people staying there. And uh, first night we went up to the cemetery and, you know, we were going to do the ghost thing and I had a recorder with me and so forth. And, got a very very peaceful feeling you can you can hear it on on episode one of pandemonium when i talk about it it's like oh it's very peaceful tonight very nice and then these trucks came through and boy the whole atmosphere changed immediately and uh we decided you know what this is not for us up here anymore we may or may not have had something thrown at us something if it dropped from a tree it picked a, an amazing time to drop from a tree because it was right as uh we describe it as, as just kind of went electric. The whole atmosphere of the cemetery and everything changed hmm. as these as these trucks came through and made a bunch of noise. And it was just it was like just not literally screaming, but the feeling was something screaming to like get out. And right. The you know hair went up on our, on the back of my neck and everything, and we, we were just like, yeah, maybe we'll make our way out of here. Maybe maybe this isn't for us right now. So went back and almost immediately fell asleep. We almost immediately went to sleep, which is unusual for me. Uh, like you, I'm a night guy. I tend to stay up late. And for whatever reason, we were probably asleep before 1 a.m., probably maybe even by 1230. And fell dead asleep. I, I slept really well until 3.30 a.m. We were woken up by wood knocks. And I can't think of anything else that could be. <laughs> they were loud, and it was something hitting something else and it sounded to me like they were coming from two different directions it sounded to me like one was a big like heavy maybe wet log that maybe still had um bark on it if that's what i was hearing you know if it was would not and then the answer sounded more like a dry like more of a, almost like a baseball bat hitting now uh Talking to Tobe, he has a whole different theory about these hits and that they're these wood knocks are actually the kind of pops that you hear associated with poltergeist activity. That they they may not in fact be something you know swinging something and, and hitting a tree at all, but mm-hmm. that that's what it sounded like. That's what it sounded like to me from my tent. Uh, it woke me up from a horrible dream. I was having this really creepy dream of uh, little hairy creatures kind of like albatwitches that were all white but they had bird heads there were three of them that were crawling all over my tent and uh they one of them had an owl head one of them had a like a sparrow head and one of them had like some kind of raptor head like either a hawk or an eagle uh but they were all white and and it was very very disturbing dream but i was woken up from that dream by these wood knocks and i could hear chad snoring and the last wood knock is so loud it woke chad up and Mm. the I had enough presence of mind to hit record on the recorder. Thankfully, I didn't think I needed to leave a recorder running all night. Uh, right. I left one in the cemetery running all night, but where we were camping, which is you know maybe a quarter mile away from the cemetery, I did not think I needed to run a recorder all night. So I was saving disk space on my re- recorder for the next day. I thought most of what's going to happen, we're going to talk about, is going to be the next day because we had planned to do you know go do some um, ghost box stuff in the cemetery and so forth. In any case, I'm woken up by these these apparent wood knocks or whatever they are, and then we proceed to have a, a pretty harrowing night where we hear something or some things walk around us the entire time. Um, Chad is a like I hike a lot. I'm in the woods a lot. I'm I'm fairly confident in the woods, but Chad is is actually a bushcraft guy. He's like a sur- survival bushcraft guy, so he's mm. he's intimately familiar with the woods. And he was like, this isn't right. <laughs> Whatever's going on here is not an animal. Um, we recorded some howls, which we cannot identify. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're not coyote. And for the first time that I've ever recorded anything and played on Strange Familiars, I don't think one person has said that's definitely a coyote. <laughs> right, right. Every other time, no matter what it was, even stuff I was sure was not coyotes, someone has said without uh, mistake, like, oh, yeah, that's a coyote. But... Uh, <laughs> I did say have one person say it's a wolf, which if it is, that's very interesting because we should not have wolves in this part of Pennsylvania. But uh, no, no one yet has said it's a coyote. 
in any case, uh, we recorded some of these, these howls during this time. Um, and then we started putting the night together. Chad felt like he saw something pass by his tent uh, in the moonlight. In fact, he, he had woken up at some point and thought he saw lights in the camp. He thought there were people in our camp, and he shined his, his headlamp out to look around because he saw something pass. And he thinks now it was something passing in front of the moonlight and casting a shadow. He was just sleeping under a tarp. He didn't have four walls around him. I, I had the, you know, the four walls of a tent, at least, around me. Uh, interestingly enough, he was woken up from a dream as well from the wood knocks, and his dream was that there were little, they were not white, but little albatross-type creatures that were running us out of camp. And huh. we had to get out of camp quickly. Uh, so that was very, very interesting that we were both having these dreams about these little creatures at the time. In any case, uh, I kept seeing something. I don't know if this is a thing or not, but it, it was worth noting all night for the rest of the night. So we're up now at three 30 and we just stayed up till morning at that point. But as we're feeling like we're hearing these things walk around us or one thing, I don't know if it was more than one. We, I kept going to the edge of the, the clearing of the campsite um, and shining my light at this one tree because it looked like there was a big white face on it. Now it didn't look like there was a body beneath it. It just looked like there was a big white face. And I did not say anything to Chad because I thought it was pareidolia. I thought, oh, th- there must be, the bark must be cleared away in that spot. And it's just, I'm, it's just pure pareidolia because it was always there on this one tree. No mm-hmm. body beneath it, just this face. So I, I thought, well, I'm not going to bring Chad over. It's just silly. It's just pareidolia. I just, but every time I walk out, boy, that's spooky looking. Well, <laughs> morning came and I looked at that tree and it had normal bark all up the tree. So I don't know what that was. I don't know if that was something or not, but you know, it's something I noted. Uh, I did see a red light in the woods, which I thought his truck was parked about a hundred yards from us. And I thought his, his headlamp hit the rear reflector of the truck. And then I realized it was in completely the wrong direction for that to be. So at some point he caught something that either reflected or lit up red in the woods but just quickly and once and then uh at some point chad kind of got frustrated and he he kind of got he's like done with this and he walked to the compass directions of the campsite basically and sort of established our territory like walked out with a light and uh from that moment it seemed to really die down like the rest of the activity died down it was almost like he he established like our area like this is our area uh it was really smart thing to do in retrospect i asked him did was that instinct or or what he said it was kind of a combination of instinct and and just knowing what to do um but things really died down and then as we're breaking camp down in the morning i was absolutely stunned because i had my pack hanging on paracord it was about five to six feet in the air uh hanging on a tree and I did not look around the backside of this tree. Why would I? I didn't know. I didn't know to look for anything. So we're just, you know, we break our tents down, and I'm, I'm taking my pack down. I'm untying this paracord, and as I swing it around the tree, there's a weight on it, and what it was is a spring. It was an old rusty bed spring that was twisted into the paracord, and you know, I something with hands had to do that. That's all I can say. Something with hands. If, if those were wood knocks, if they weren't, you know, these, these pops associated with poltergeist activity that Tobe talks about, if they were wood knocks, something with hands had to do those. Something with hands had to swing something to hit the tree, to make those sounds. Uh, you know, I can't say it was Bigfoot. I can't, you know, I don't know that that's what it was. I didn't see anything. But whatever it was, human, non-human, spirit, Bigfoot, whatever it was, seemed like it wanted to show us that it could come right into camp and do whatever it wants. I mean, that's the way I took it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and retro- I don't know. I don't know if I would have taken it so hostilely. Well, that's retrospectively. I think it's more playful, um, you know, but I think it was still telling us that, but more in a playful way. But at the time it seemed really, really creepy because to do that, they had to be looking directly, whatever it was, had to be looking directly into Chad's tarp, looking at him sleep. So there's this really kind of creepy element to that. But 
um you know yeah i mean it's it's almost playful i don't know i don't know uh it, it, how would you have taken it uh as a form of communication just as a form of communication like i'm here <clears throat> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't assume this stuff thinks the same way we do. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a trap that many people, including me, fall into often. You know, and you know that the uh, the knock thing. I mean, I've pointed that out as part of the whole wilderness Bigfoot thing or wilderness poltergeist thing. That's you know, knocking is such a common aspect in uh, poltergeist activity. Mm-hmm. So much of it starts with knocking and then expands from there. Right, right. Yeah, like 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 Tobe has mentioned, he's got tons of audio from his place that he's recorded, and he's mentioned like almost every time they start with some kind of knock or a hit, yeah. and then th- this other audio happens. It's very very interesting. Um, yeah. So w- is that what that was? It, it could have been. It, it really could have been. I I don't know. It sounded like something you know being swung and hit at a tree, but I didn't see it. You know, I didn't, I didn't see anything. And, and and even the spring, I mean, it's not unusual for poltergeist activity to uh, move things around, pile things up in unusual ways. I mean, having a spring attached to that isn't that isn't outside the realm of potential poltergeist activity as well. Right. Now there was okay. So the ground is very rocky. You can't see footprints, but there were ferns on the ground. There were high ferns, and there was a wake in the ferns where you could see something had walked through from the woods directly to that tree and if you follow that path about 10 feet from the tree is an old rusty uh box spring where there whatever i'm assuming walked through picked up that spring and then twisted it twisted it into that paracord now uh because that wake we could follow that wake almost literally around the camp we could see whatever walked around us presumably left that wake through through the weeds and we were able to follow it almost in a circle around our camp Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. This well, is the, and, and I don't dismiss the dreams either. It's interesting that you guys had those dreams. Yeah, see, now I think I would have in the past, but recently I've like, I've realized that those are probably tied into it, and I think they're, they're very important now. Um, when Chad told me, I know he told me at the time, he said, I, I had a dream we were being driven out of camp. And it wasn't until we got home that we actually compared notes on the dream because so much other stuff was happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we had some, we had left some stuff, you know, other than the things Tobe gave me, we had left um, over the hill from, from our tent, we'd left this little offering area. And uh, we, I put out the owl feather he gave me. Uh, the, this, our friend Mark was there with us during the day. He didn't stay the night. He was just there during the day. He had left an apple out and some, a little pile of cinnamon and some other things, and we left a piece of uh, slag from Kador's furnace out as well. Hmm. So we went down to check that. The apple was gone, but there was a, fo- a uh, paw print of a fox in the cinnamon. So we assumed that what happened was the fox stepped in the cinnamon to grab the apple and, uh, and left with that. However, the slag from Kador's furnace was gone. was nowhere to be found. So oh. pre- presumably foxes don't take that. Generally. Yeah. Then we went to the cemetery where I had left the cedar ball on the wall. And uh, so earlier in the day, I forgot to even mention this. This is a big part of the story. I did not see this happen. Chad saw this happen. And this comes into, this ties into the precognitive stuff you were talking about. Was that before we started recording? That's before we started recording. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking a little bit about the precog stuff. So near the cemetery, I just felt compelled for some reason to go out the backside of the cemetery and just explore a little bit. And I was out there for a bit and then Chad came out with me and we were talking and this is all in like right in the middle of the old town of pandemonium basically. But it's, you know, it's all woods now and you can just see, like I said, you can see these piles of, of foundation or foundations were. And, uh, Chad's talking to me and then he, he looks back towards one of these piles and he says, there was a Karen up there and it's gone. I said, what do you mean? He said, there was a cairn on that foundation. I, I was going to tell you about it because one of the things we do is we build these cairns and see if they're, they're changed. Mm-hmm. And he said, I was going to tell you about it because there was one there and it, it disappeared. I'm like, you're kidding me. He's like, no, it, it just, it was there and it's not there. So I said, 
let's go build one there then. We have to build one there and we'll see if the, you know, it's been knocked down or whatever and, and we have to build one. And we went up there and I basically picked the rocks out. Like, here, use, use this and handed it to him and he stacked them up as I handed it to him. And then he steps back and he says, that's the Karen I saw. Now, these weren't rocks that had fallen. These were rocks that I was picking up, you know, randomly. Like, you know, just like, this is a good flat one. Use this one, you know, like, like that. So it's not like we rebuilt something that was there. But when we built it, he's like, that's what I saw. So, you know, people have asked, was he looking at the Karen you built in the future? I don't know. I don't know at all. But it was very, very interesting. And he's, he's very insistent that one was there and then it wasn't. So... Huh. Uh, that was the first weird thing that happened in the day that happened before any of the other stuff. But anyway, in the morning we go up to check that that was still there. We expected there to be, you know, something crazy there. If, uh, even possibly the, the piece of slag from down below or something, but no, that was, there was nothing there, but the cedar ball on the cemetery wall had been moved. It had been moved. I had placed it kind of in the middle of the stone. There was a little pocket so it wouldn't roll around. And it had been moved to the very edge of the stone. Like, he couldn't get it any closer to the edge without it rolling off. So, you know, could a squirrel have done that? Yeah, absolutely. But it was, it picked a very interesting place to stop rolling the ball. And we, I, we kind of put the ball back in that little pocket and left for the day. And I got home to a message from Tobe that said, do you still have that cedar ball? And I went, what the heck? This is like, <laughs> it's like a Facebook messenger message or something. So now I have to wait to get a reply to him from him to see, like, why are you asking this? Because he didn't know I was going to pandemonium. He didn't know I took the cedar ball. He knew nothing about this. Nothing about this. Uh, in fact, the, he kind of sent the stuff for me to kind of leave it Hex Hollow or someplace I could check frequently. You know, that was sort of the intention. So right. I kind of felt weird. I was like, oh, does he want it back? Like, what? Why is he asking this? <laughs> So it's, you know, a couple hours till he, he replies to me and he says, oh, I'm just asking because one showed up here today, here being at his house in Washington State. So now I am completely freaked out. I'm like, okay, are we talking about an apport from one coast to the other with the cedar ball? Because he's, he's had apports around his place before. And, uh, I, there's no way of knowing, you know, we're two hours away from this thing. So, you know, I called Chad, I tell him the whole story and we, we said, with well, we got to go back. We got to go back on Friday. This was Sunday. So Friday, you know, we, we run back up there and the cedar ball is there. It has not moved to my knowledge, but now I have to contact Tobe and make sure he still has the one he was talking about. And he, right. did. he did. Okay. So it, it wasn't in a port uh, to our knowledge. But it was a heck of a synchronicity for a cedar ball to show up at his place after that whole night of experiences we had there. Wow. And, I mean, I don't think there's any limitation on how far an app work can travel, because I don't think it's working within that time frame. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole thing. It could disappear and show up years later. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's it, they work outside of our time. Absolutely. Hmm. So you've only made the one trip to Pandemonium. Well, the two, the one and the follow up. Right, so right, but that beautiful. was yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's two hours away. It's not easy to get to, but uh, yeah, we're going back. As and I was shook. You know, I'll admit it. I was shook, but I have to go back. I I, I will force myself to stay there again. Hmm. Is there any other paranormal history to the place that you found? There are some ghost stories and uh, really interesting. I met another witness in Michaud to talk about uh, Bigfoot stuff in Michaud. And after he was telling his stories to us, this has been about a week and a half, I think, after we were at Pandemonium. So I started telling him, I was like, oh, you know, I went up to this place called Pandemonium and, uh, you know, told him everything that happened. And he said, yeah, that's a weird place. I, I camped there. And he told me where he camped. He camped at the next campsite over from us. Uh, he was even closer to the town than, than we were basically in, in the town where we camped. But he would have been like right in the middle of the town. He camped near. There was an old steam tannery. That was the, the town business. He basically camped at that steam tannery. And he told me a story of something walking up to his tent. He, could, he said he could hear it clear as day. He was camping with his wife. He walked up to his tent. 
his dog was in the tent with him. He said his dog was uh like the you know its uh, hackles went up and and it was like growling and and freaked out and and uh, he opened the fly of the tent, shined his light out, said couldn't see a thing. He said whatever it was walked up right to the front of my tent. I zipped up my tent and it sounded like it walked away then into the woods. He said, but it sounded like it started walking right from the area. It had stopped, you know, from, from right in front of his tent. As soon as he zips it up, it walks away. So, he, you know, he didn't see a thing, but he had this experience. Um, so he, he's on pandemonium part two as well. I have his story in there, but uh, that was just like some random guy, you know, that, that I didn't know he had ever been to pandemonium and he comes out with that story. And then we were contacted by, a uh, a woman who'd been there before as well and she's confirmed a lot of things we were talking about um very very interesting she, she'd been there multiple times so what kind, of, what kind of things did she confirm uh having stones thrown at her uh, okay. the, the one area where we saw the, the disappearing karen she said uh is a very very creepy area she said that like a, a lot of like her she and her friends don't even like going back in that area and uh the sound of and we did experience this of trucks that sound like they're coming up the road and then never, you never see them. So it sounds like there was one that, that sounded like it was coming up so close to us that we actually got off the road cause it was nighttime. And, and uh, <laughs> when we went out to the cemetery, Chad had insisted on taking a, a old timey oil lamp as our light source instead of any kind of, you know, thing that you could actually see by. And the oil burned out about halfway up to the cemetery, so we had no light at all. It was fine. We had we had some moonlight that we could see, but uh, this truck's coming, so we have to get way off the road because we have no light. If it's coming through, it's not going to see us at all. So we, you know, we're way off the road into the weeds at this point, just waiting for this truck to drive by, and it it never shows up. So she actually mentioned that, and I hadn't even talked about it on the podcast. It was only after she mentioned it that I talked about it on, on episode two because we did we did experience that and that's something she talked about. That I think could be just the way sound it travels up that valley though. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. it 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 because I've experienced like just weird well you were at site seven. Like sound just goes up that mountain in weird ways there. Yeah. And I, the the train when you hear the train <laughs> there it sounds like it's ten feet into the woods away from you, you know? And it's actually across the river at site seven. Like that's how far away it is. And it's just the way sound is there. It's just weird. It's just, and it's funneled weird. I don't think there's any paranormal, anything paranormal about it. It's just the sound is funneled in in a weird way. And, and it I can think, sound weird when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my gut tells me, like at Pandemonium, that's probably what's going on It's with the truck sounds. Like it's, it's somehow traffic noise is being funneled in in some kind of weird way. And it just sounds very immediate and like they're very close and they're not. Hmm. Um. What's the other place, Michaud? Michaud, yeah, Michaud Forest, and uh, that's that's an an ongoing work we're doing. Uh, that is a whole other place, and that is connected to iron furnaces, which we didn't realize. It's a second growth forest. In the 1800s, it was uh, basically a wasteland. Uh, they had all of these iron furnaces throughout what is this uh, huge state forest, and. Uh, the, they had cut all the trees down either to make charcoal or they were having a lot of fires and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I mean, iron furnaces are not nice to the environment. Right. Uh, so things were, you know, it's pretty much a wasteland. I've seen pictures of it from the time. It was, it was not a forest at all at that point. And uh, so we're having a lot of, you know, strange activity there. And we're having some questions as to whether it's Chad uh, it's me and Chad together, or what is going on? Is is something? Did something? <laughs> the same thing from Pandemonium. Did that somehow communicate to whatever's in Michaud? Is it the same thing in both places? We don't. We have no clue what's going on here. But uh, there seems to be some connection, maybe between the two, or like I said, unless it's just Chad and I. Maybe it's whatever our chemistry is. Is just fires this stuff off. I don't know. No, it's certainly possible if it resembles it, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know how the, the how it would be a related entity in two completely, because they're vastly different places, right? Uh, they are, yeah, I mean, again, they're about two hours away from each other, you know, driving. It's a different mountain chain. Um, 
what the the mountain chain that runs through Michaud is called South Mountain, and that it's very interesting because the South Mountains we are now tracking sightings all up and down the the South Mountain range. Um, so S- sightings you know, as in Bigfoot, Bigfoot, uh, big cats, and by big cats I mean like bigger than cougars. Like I had a guy call me with a like a twelve foot long cat uh, report with red glowing eyes that he saw. And he said it looked very oily. Um, and that was in the same area. Uh, flannel man sightings. Uh, but a lot of Bigfoot. A lot of Bigfoot stuff. Hmm. Trying to see on the map. So it's right outside of Harrisburg, the Michelle Fo- State Forest is. Uh, it kind of starts outside of Harrisburg to the north and then goes all the way down basically to the Maryland line uh, at, at, west of Gettysburg. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I know I had ended up in the midst of one of these forests after taking a, a wrong turn, but I think it was this one, which is just state game lands and no state forest. Uh, yeah, that looks like where I ended up. I just know they had red roads and it freaked me out. Huh. Like red clay or, or I guess, I don't know. I, I cause it was like, I, this was pre smartphone. And I took the wrong turn out of Scranton, heading to New York City. And by the time I realized it, I was uh, I was on my way toward Wilkes-Barre. Mm. And and I was like, okay, so I can either turn around, go all the way back to Scranton, and then go the way I normally go, or I can just continue south until I hit, I think, 80 was what I ended up on. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I hit 80, it, it went through all that, that, that forest. There's a bunch of little forests from the looks of it. I don't think I've ever looked this up before. And... Um, yeah, the, it was very creepy. I don't know. And the roads were just red. And huh. I was like, why are the roads red? And there's nothing around anywhere. It is so desolate. Yeah, there's the, Pennsylvania's got some creepy, creepy forests. Um, you know, that said, Tuscarora, where we were, it didn't seem particularly creepy. Um, the show definitely gets a, gets a creepy vibe in some places. And it's, it's full of interesting place names. These these uh, the, one of the areas that we've been going to is called Harry Springs and it's spelled H A I R Y and we're trying to figure out why it's called that. Like, huh. Who named it that and why? Well, but also there, there's some other like you know there's Dead Woman's Hollow is there and and there's you know a lot of lot of creepy places like that. And and, and also if it's on a mountain range, it's probably I would think has some te- tectonic activity there. One would assume, yeah. Um, and that's, you know, where weird stuff tends to follow, you know, earth lights and things like that. So that's not highly, you know, unusual to have uh, anything anything that follows a fault line or anything to have weird stuff attached to it. Maybe it is, Chad. We had an earthquake here recently, and it, the epicenter was very close to his house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it works that way, but maybe. <laughs> You have the power to create earthquakes. <laughs> that would be interesting. Huh. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at this. There's a lot of forests and uh, parks and stuff in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people imagine Pennsylvania and they think Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but there's a, there's a whole lot in between. Yeah. Oh, I, I knew that. It's just I'm, I'm looking. It's kind of weird. I guess they're following the mountain range. I don't have the... Because they're, they're, they're all in a weird sort of like twist as they go up along the state. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure what that is. Hmm. What mountain range is, is Michaud in? That's the, it's called the South Mountains. Oh, okay. And what's the other one in? I'm not sure what mountain range that is. I know, I know, I think Blue Mountain is one of them. But I'm not, I'm not sure the range up there. I'm not sure the name of that range. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it kind of everything just kind of sweeps up and turns right as it goes through Pennsylvania. If you look at like a map, the the Appalachian Trail basically follows the the ridge line of the South Mountains uh, as it comes down from Harrisburg, and it's it's uh, I mean it's beautiful, but it'll it'll tear your shoes up because it's <laughs> it's it's uh, I think of you know the through hikers usually call you know Pennsylvania the shoe killer. Because it's just those ridges are just 
rocks and rocks and rocks, and they will tear your shoes right up. Yeah. Well, that's probably what I'm looking at is the way the ridge runs. Mm-hmm. It's just unusual because you don't see it. It must be. It's that whole mountain range going all the way down to uh, Tennessee, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess I've just never looked at it on Google Maps like this because it really it's like something just created a, a stain across the, the states. <laughs> like someone was doing watercolor and smeared the paint going all the way from Chattanooga through Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. You know, we were t- we were talking briefly too. I, I messaged you because I was listening to one of your shows on Flannel Man, and you said a lot of the Flannel Man encounters were happening in the early '90s. And I I commented to you that a lot of grunge was happening in the early '90s too, with a lot of flannel. Right. Yeah. And you got to wonder if that's just some kind of not uh, what's the word for it, uh, egr- egregore. Yeah, I I mean, obviously the you know Flannel Man reports happened before and after that, but there does seem to be like this. The majority of the reports I've, the people I've talked to have been this early 90s time period. And that, in fact, that's when Allison saw hers, you know. So, uh, so you got you got to wonder if it was just something in the in the culture. Yeah, I, if it was, you know, why specifically flannel? Yeah, I have no clue. I have no clue on that. I, I, I wish I could figure that one out. <laughs> hmm. All right. Um. But yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting that it, it kind of coincides with the the uh, the grunge movement, which was so based around that image of just like mm-hmm. dressing like that. Like flannel was such a huge part of it. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I remember several, you know, of these witnesses have told me just like, yeah, I, I just thought it was some guy from a grunge band or or something. You know, what I mean, like they've <laughs> they've used that as a reference point. You know. Huh. That's see. That's really interesting to me because it's like, it, it, what would? Why would these these two things coincide like that? Because you know? they could blend in easier. It's Maybe like, so this is why you wear camouflage in the woods. <laughs> Has anything new come of the uh, bunny man or or flannel man encounters that you've had? Uh, that you've heard, I mean, uh, heard of? I mean, I get you know, I get a fairly consistent uh, stream of of flannel man, bunny man less so. I I did get one recently. And uh, I had an interview scheduled, which I need to reschedule. I had to, I had to cancel some interviews last week just because things got so crazy putting the Pandemonium show together. And um, Chad was leaving town. I had to get his his uh, commentary on it before he left and so forth. So I had a Bunny Man interview scheduled, um, which I, I need to, again, I need to reschedule that. But they're a lot less frequent. But they, they do roll in here and there. But the Flannel Mans, I still get, usually, you know, I'd say... It's probably slow to maybe one every other week now, but uh, fairly consistent reports come in. Mm. Now, how many would you say for, from the early 90s? Percentage-wise, I bet like 50% of what, what I've, I've uh, received has been from that time period, honestly. Hmm. And the rest are before or after? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a weirdly specific thing. It really is. It really is. And then... The the ones that I'm I'm getting now, which I I tend to like more than the the, the bedroom invader thing, where people wake up and just see them, are people who are they're remembering other paranormal instances, mm. and either before or after they ran into a guy in a flannel shirt and they didn't think it was anything because it's so such a normal thing, you know, such a normal article of clothing. They didn't think it was and there was anything special about it, but. I, for instance, I had a guy telling he went to uh, as part of a high school thing. He went. To, they spent the night outside of a ghost town, and he said, "I never thought about it till years later." But there was this really weird guy that had driven his car. He's like, "These are old roads. You weren't supposed to drive on them." He'd driven his car in there, and he was wearing red flannel. And he he was talking to my teacher. He's like, "It was this really odd person," but he said, "I you know I didn't think anything of it at the time because it was just a guy in a flannel shirt." But years later, you know, he starts putting it together. I've talked to some people who've had, like, Bigfoot sightings or UFO sightings who afterwards or before have just saw what they thought to be a regular guy in a red flannel shirt. And it's only after hearing these flannel man stories that they put it together and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it wasn't just a regular guy. Hmm. And that that's a whole nother level of, like, how does the universe work? Mm-hmm. 
you know, like what the, these, like, like Mike Clellan talking about the owl stuff, you know, it's not always that it's an unusual owl. It's, it's, it's a synchronicity that you see an owl right at a certain time. Right. Um, right. so someone has a weird paranormal experience that encounters a weird person in panel flannel that seems to be completely real, but stands out as unusual or someone sees someone walking down the street that stands out as unusual Mm -hmm. and they can't quite put their finger on why. Yep. Yep. Speaking of, by the way, at uh, pandemonium immediately after those howls, we started getting owl calls. (laughs) Really? Yeah. There were no owl calls earlier in the night. And then all of a sudden we started getting owl calls after the, the howls. And this is all, this is all, all that took place within five minutes or less of us waking up. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think that it's, it's, I don't know if synchronistics, the really the right word for it. It's almost like you're, you're in this slot in reality where things are more morphic, you know, like they, they, they everything has that much more meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's taken you out of the normal basic reality and slid you just a little to the side and you're in this slot with all this other stuff and everything means something. Even if you don't know what it means, it, it means something on a different level to you. You like you notice it. It's it's yeah. like that. That was something. I don't know what it meant, but it was something that you know struck struck me oddly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, and uh, as Tobe said, it's almost sometimes like it's tailor made for you, and you can't even explain. It's he he described it perfectly. He said it's like if you're wearing a tailor made suit, you know what's wrong with it. You know what's like right with it. But you can't necessarily explain that to other people. You can just, it feels r- right in this part. It feels wrong in this part. There's an yeah. imperfection here, every, you know, whatever it is. Be, but it's so hard to explain because it, it's kind of almost tailor-made to you. It's, it's kind of focused on you in a sense. And, uh, and, and that was, you know, I, I've, anyone who listened to the Patreon episode of my, my talk about, uh, um, oh, what's it called? Hellier. I was I was pretty critical of some of the stuff they did, um, but I also understood that in the moment it feels like things mean more than when you're just watching it disconnected, you know, mm-hmm. on a television or or a screen of some sorts. I I think that's almost the entire key to Hellier, is that it it's it comes down to how well you feel they translated that, you know, whether, yeah. whether you can whether that was translated to you that. And I almost wish they'd had more people on that that weren't in their group talking about these instances. So, and I'm specifically referring to the tin can here, where if they had more people on and said, like, okay, to everyone looking at that, that's just a tin can, big deal. But to people, to them in that moment, it's more than a tin can, and it is a big deal, and it's a very big deal. And I think if they had some people maybe outside of their group that kind of explained that, you know, I mean, I think that would have the the uh, documentary would have benefited it greatly from that. And and I think the tin can was the only paranormal thing that happened, honestly, in that whole series. Um, and I think it was a time loop. Um, I think that they were so excited and so freaked out by finding the tin can that it actually sent that information backwards in time to him while he was doing the ghost box thing. And so he saw the tin can and then it, so it kind of created this time loop mm-hmm. where he was only excited about the tin can cause he saw it, but he only saw it because he was excited about it when he found it. Right. Right. Which is no less special. I mean, that's a very, no, very interesting no. and special thing. Yeah. But I don't think it related to what they thought they were looking after. I think they were just following a hoax, you know, and I don't know. Like the rest yeah. of it left me cold, but that to me stood out. I was like, well, that's actually interesting. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's, that's, that's actually interesting. Cause that's from, for most people I've heard complain about it. That's like their number one complaint. It, it boils down to it's a tin can big deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not the fact that it's a tin can. It's the fact that they made a big deal of the tin can, which potentially sent that information backwards. Because mm-hmm. we know emotional states are the things that we pick up on from the future. Mm-hmm. So, so we can either look at it as we can see things that are coming or that there's some outlay, you know, whether we live in a static universe or not, but there's some outlay that emotional events in the future can send information backwards in time. Right. Right. 
and if that's what's happening, you know, them finding the can, it, it, and it, it is a closed loop, you know, like mm. both, both instances are necessary for that to have happened. Right. Right. And it's, uh, and, and I think understanding time is kind of a key to some of this stuff that time does not function the way we think it does. Just like everything else, we just make assumptions about it. Mm hmm. But I think there are times where the future affects the past and vice versa. Well, I mean, we know the past affects the future, obviously. But right, right. I think there are things that where the future affects the past. It's not such a narrow, straight line as we think it is. Yeah, yeah. We, we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording. I, I think yeah. we probably organize it linearly time. Because I mean, we need to. Yeah, yeah. We, in order to function, you, you need that, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think it probably works not quite that way. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was telling you about some of the weird stuff I've had happen. Um, one of them, I, I'm trying to work on one of the two books I want to get done. And I was taking notes and, uh, from outside, I heard a weird noise. This is like 10 o'clock at night. I grabbed my spotlight. I shine it out the window. There's nothing. I assumed it was an animal or something. I couldn't really like the noise was kind of like, I didn't get a good, good hear of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I heard something that didn't sound right. And then, okay, whatever. And I went back to, to working on the notes. And then I heard what sounded like, um, tires spinning on wet asphalt, like kind of like a <laughs> kind of a noise. And I was like, okay, there's someone doing something with a car. And I'm, then I realized I didn't hear an engine. I just heard spinning. And I was like, okay. And then it did it again. And I'm like, all right, I'm going back outside or going outside. So I went outside and I looked around. There was nothing. Okay. Came back inside. I'm working on more notes. And then I hear it again. And I realized that the first no noise I heard was probably the same noise. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh. And I heard it another time. And I'm like, all right, going back out again. And as I'm going back out, I'm thinking, you know, people who have UFO sightings sometimes explain it as the sound of tires on wet asphalt. <laughs> And I'm like, ooh, am I going to see a UFO? But sadly, no. I went outside. I, I basically stood outside in the dark for like half an hour. And nothing happened. I mean, it was nice. It was a nice night and, mm -hmm. you know, comfortable and stuff. But, I mean, nothing unusual happened while I was out there. There was one point where I saw something moving across the field. And I, I couldn't tell if it's a trick of the eye. The problem with any time you're looking at stuff dark is that your eyes do, can easily play tricks on you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these... <laughs> Going out on these these uh, night adventures, I've realized how poor my night vision is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm I'm standing there looking at the field, and I see what literally looks like something starting to walk up to me, like just kind of a, a, a uh, like a predator like form, like that Shimmer Man sort of thing. And I pick up the spotlight, hit it with the spotlight, and there's nothing there at all. And I'm like, okay, so most likely my eyes were playing tricks on me. If not, then whatever this thing was did not like the light. Mm -hmm. But I'm going for the first one. I think it was probably my eyes playing trick us, tricks on me because it was fairly dark. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's why I like to have a second person. <laughs> true. Are you seeing true. this too? You um, that thing? And it doesn't, you know, and, and sometimes these things are not material things. They're, they're things we're picking up with other senses too. So, yeah. Another person is not always the, the best. Uh, the the best uh, judge on whether or not it's real because as as we've seen there are points where we experience different realities for whatever True. reason whether it's our perception or we're literally experiencing different realities yeah yeah um and at the, the same time while i was doing those notes i kept hearing pretty steady music coming from the front of the house and anytime i stood up to go check it out it just stopped and i'm like yeah yeah okay because that happens in this house. You just hear music, mm -hmm. and then the, there's no music. And sometimes it's very, very distinct. Distinct in the sense that you can identify it? You can't identify the music, but you can hear, like, pauses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, there, there was one night when I was laying in bed, and I started hearing it, and it sounded like a television running. And I knew there was no television on. Um, and I'm laying there. And I'm thinking, okay, it's just like a, it's probably just sort of a matrix thing of the sound of the fan and the air conditioner, you know, making it sound like something. Right. But that, then I would hear a break 
and then a completely different type of sound, like a commercial was playing. And when it did that, I said, okay, all right, look, that's something that's actually on. And I got up and everything was dead quiet. Mm. So again, is it something playing with your senses? Is your brain organizing that stuff in a certain way to make it sound like that? Cause you're expecting it. It's really hard to tell. Cause we don't have that much control over our senses. Yeah. Yeah. I, we can focus on something, sure, but I mean, we're relying on those senses to show us what's really there or tell us what's really there, but it's very easy to kind of like drift off into something that's not. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that uh, I don't think I ever talked about the, the um, maybe I did, about the orbs in my uh, living room, in my studio. Oh, the, uh, the, the ones you caught on camera. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I've talked about that on the show. Um, so basically, I was I was working on some video in the back room, and the fire alarm went off. And I was like, why is the fire alarm going off? This happens now occasionally, so it doesn't quite freak me out like it used to. And so I walked into the front of the house, and the fire alarm stopped. And there was nothing. And I tested it. It's a fairly, it's, it's under a year old, so it shouldn't be having too many issues. And so I, I tested it, and it was fine. And then I came into the back, and I said, you know what? I'm going to pull up the cameras and see what they got. And they both alerted to me to the fact that the fire alarm went off, which was nice of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the one in, in the dining room where it happened, and there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing there. And suddenly you just see the lights on the fire alarm start flickering, and then it starts ringing, and then it goes off. And I was like, huh. All right. And so then I looked in the next room in the studio just to see if I, you know, anything else showed up and what you see, especially when I looked at the longer, uh, time period, right before the fire alarm goes off, all of a sudden, all these, what look like dust particles start shooting straight up right in front of the camera and they're going up and up and it's straight lines straight up. You saw this. I should have sent this to mm-hmm. you, right? Mm-hmm. And then the fire alarm goes off. And then when the fire alarm stops, a few more of them shoot up and then they just stop. Now, mind you, there's no, uh, the air conditioner was on the whole time, but there's no, obviously no furnace or anything running. There's nothing that should have moved dust around. Uh, I went in later and I just hit the two chairs in that area of the room just to see, you know, if I could stir up some dust and then. One of the chairs stirred up a decent amount of dust, uh, the older chair, and it looked nothing like what I got. But when I, even when I did that, so I hit the chair and I, I took a couple steps back and waited for the dust to rise. And two little particles, orbs, whatever, shot up right next to me, straight up, like from the floor, mm-hmm. uh, directly next to me in a straight line. And then all the dust went past the camera and I went, and I'm looking at that going, I'm sure that's just dust, but I really can't explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, those videos you showed me look a lot like the, Oh, I, I think I talked about in your show before the Bigfoot witness who called me to his house. And after we did the Bigfoot stuff, he, he stopped me and said, well, you know, my house is haunted. And, uh, he started showing me pictures and video that he'd taken. And a lot of them were orbs, and a lot of them looked almost exactly like what you showed me. Hmm. See, I don't know what to make of it, because generally I, I tend to dismiss orbs. You know, like I, I feel like there's so much stuff, especially when a camera's on night vision, that can reflect in a camera. It's really hard to tell. But it was the path. It was the fact that these things basically went straight. Up. Yeah, they shot straight up, and it was kind of like one on either side of you, wasn't it? Like Yeah, the second time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I have not, you know, like, I can pull that camera up now, and you won't see any dust in that room. You know, there's no dust moving through the air. There's, It's not, I could look at any time, and that, you don't see it. It just happened right then when the fire alarm went off. Mm-hmm. And it's the coincidence of those two things going, happening at the same time that struck me as odd. Yeah. And it, it sort of suggests that something maybe blew into the room. Uh, but all the windows are shut, and the, like I said, the air conditioner was on. Nothing. There was no scent. There's nothing else on. There's nothing in camera on camera where the uh, the alarm went off. You know, there's no dust particles or anything like that. So I don't know. Like I don't know what to make of it. I, I did put it up for Patreons as well. 
but I, I don't have a good explanation. And, and those things, you know, people are so easy to take pictures of stuff like that and be like, oh, look, orbs. And it's like, okay, but it's probably dust. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the ghost hunting world version of the leaf face pareidolia Bigfoot. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again and again. The, uh, I remember there was, there was a group up in Buffalo and they had put up some investigation in a cemetery or something they went through and they, they walked up to this grave and they, they felt like it was, a, it was kind of odd and they took a picture and there's nothing really in the picture. And then they continued walking. You can see the grass is fairly high, you know, and they walked past this grave and suddenly someone stopped and said, Oh wait, I feel something. And they, and so someone turned around, took a picture with flash at night. And there's just orbs everywhere and they're freaking out. Like, look at all these orbs. And I'm like, oh my God, you just walked through that area with high grass in the summer. It's pollen, it's <laughs> insects, it's dust. It's like, seriously. <laughs> and they did something similar in like a underground, uh, station they were in or something like an old train station where they started putting up pictures of like all this all these orbs they were getting in the flash and i'm like okay yeah <laughs> like someone needs to understand that this is dust but people are so desperate for that photo evidence i, I don't know why that's the gold standard especially the, today yeah yeah exactly but they're they're really really you know thirsty for that photo evidence and I mean, I like having stuff on, you know, if I can get a picture of something awesome, but I don't, I don't put an excessive amount of value in it. Mm -hmm. Like looking at those two videos is interesting to me. I think, I think it's, it's interesting because it tells me something unusual went on. I don't have a good explanation for it, but it doesn't prove anything. Right. Right. And I don't think photographic evidence ever will at this point. I think. No, the, I mean. The one thing that will prove stuff to people is if they have a personal experience. Because mm -hmm. even if mainstream science came out and said, yes, Psy is real, there will still be people going, no, it's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, even if it became the standard, there are still going to be people who go, no, unless they have that personal experience where they go, huh, okay, you know. The, you can take something totally mundane. Let's, let's, let's take uh, the cougar. In Pennsylvania, I, I've seen them myself in uh, northern Maryland. So if they're there. They're in Pennsylvania, you know, just, just over the line. I know tons of people who've seen them. I know people who've caught them on game camps in Pennsylvania. And you will still get hunters that will tell you, no, they're not here. I've never seen one. <laughs> As if that means, like, just because you've never seen one, yeah. they're not here. But they will tell you straight up, they're not. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. They're not here. It's like, well, no, they've been, they've been photographed on game. You know I mean? We have multiple pictures of them. They're yeah. absolutely here. And it's not say, Bigfoot. Right. Right. Yeah. This is like not, you don't, there's not a debate as to whether mountain lions exist. Right. Exactly. The debate is whether they're in Pennsylvania or not. And they've been caught on cameras. They're here. You know, there are, there are multiple witnesses, multiple people, but they've been caught on camera and you know, they're absolutely there. And then they, you'll still get guys. that will just tell you, no, they're not. <laughs> I've never seen one. They're not here. Huh? Yeah. And that's, you know, and, and again, the photographic evidence isn't enough, right? They'd have to encounter one themselves. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I was getting at. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's what's so hard with some of this stuff. So much of it comes, it, it's not even necessarily belief. It's, it's personal experience. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, anyone can believe one way or the other, but when you have that personal experience, it, it becomes much harder to deny. I mean, people still deny it sometimes, but if it's, if it's uh, explicit enough, it, it really stands out to you and you kind of go, okay, you know, th this happened. Yeah. yeah there, there, there are times, and, and I said uh, pandemonium was one of them for me, where it reaches out and taps you on the shoulder and it says, I am real. Like, this, mm -hmm. is, this is a real thing. Now, what it is, I don't know. Yeah, right. I, I have to remain agnostic about that. I don't know what it is, but it's real. It it yeah. is a thing. You know, something is happening. And and that goes back to like what I've said from early on in this show. It's like 
people have these experiences. You don't, you don't have to believe their interpretation of the experience, but these experiences go back as far as written history and probably quite a, you know, probably throughout human history period, not just written history. Mm-hmm. Um, it, they've always been here and they've been interpreted different ways by different people, you know, and that's, that's fine. We don't have to believe the interpretation to understand that people have these experiences and they affect them. Right. So we don't just throw that away because these have very real world consequences for people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And at, and at the same time, like if someone, uh, I don't know, uh, they, they, they lose a family member and that family member visits them in a dream or they see them in their room and they get the feeling that they're okay, there's no reason to tear that apart. You know, right. from any side, it's like, oh, you feel better about things because this happened. Good. Believe what you want about it. That makes you feel better. Uh, there's no way to prove that that's what it was, but you'll get skeptics who will be like, you didn't experience that. That wasn't real. You were hallucinating. It was, it was grief. And it's like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, like, I, stop, I, stop that, you know? Yeah. Well, and there's it's like, again, this, it doesn't translate unless you've experienced it sometimes, you know? And, and I don't know if that's a, a lack of, I don't want to say empathy, but you know, I think some people just, they can't imagine it. You know, it doesn't fall oh, yeah. w- within there. It's not their experience at all, you yeah. know? And I mean, you've met these people that, that just live in this like Newtonian world and mm-hmm. th- it could come and tap them on their shoulder. And they're going to, those are the kind of people that shut down. They, they either have breakdowns cause they can't handle it or they just shut down and deny it ever happened anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is like, that you know like 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 take trying to take that that experience away from someone is selfish and it's 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 because they have to push their own worldview onto someone mm-hmm. and it's not acceptable that this worldview is different even if it's making them feel better because we have no idea if that's the, you know, what they interpreted it as or not, you know, and when I say that we, we don't have to believe the interpretation, it doesn't mean the interpretation is wrong. It means we have no way of knowing whether the interpretation is right or not. Right. You can, you, you can go into a haunted house and say it's ghosts, but we have no way to verify that it's ghosts. Right. You know, you can see, you can see a Bigfoot in the woods, but we have no way to identify or to verify at this point, if that was a physical creature, the person saw or some kind of phantom. Right. I, I can I can talk about my experience in pandemonium to a Bigfoot person, and they'll say that is absolutely Bigfoot behavior. Right, you experience to a poltergeist person, they 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 oh, that is absolutely poltergeist behavior. What you yes. experience, and like I said, a light in the house is a ghost. A light in the woods is you know Bigfoot. A light in the sky is aliens. Mm-hmm. It, it's all in context, but a lot of the phenomena kind of overlap, and I don't think there's, an, there's a single explanation for everything, uh, but I do think it all connects to us. I think these experiences happen to us for a reason. Yeah, I, the more and more I dig at it, I just think I can't tell you how they're connected. Again, I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you why, but I, I, I just get this gut feeling that it, it's connected. It's all connected somehow. And that's, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it just, it feels so like there's so much connective tissue between these different phenomena that it's almost impossible for me to deny it at this point. The, uh, and I mean, the, the thing is, so, you know, someone might see a dead relative and it might legitimately be the spirit of that dead relative, but somebody else might see something very much like it and it has nothing to do with someone who died. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's there. It, it could be different things using the same mechanism or 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 affecting us in the same way that we see it in a similar way. Yet it's two different things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think a lot of again, I think a lot of it has to do with us and the way we perceive things and the way we affect the reality around us, which we absolutely do. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, that's one of the books I'm working on is how this all kind of keys together. Hopefully I'll actually finish it. And <laughs> it's just, it's, it's hard to even work my brain around what I'm trying to write. There's it's just, really, it's really difficult to write about this stuff in ways th- that translate to writing and one, you know, that people are going to be able to read and understand clearly 
mm-hmm. because w- when we're discussing it, we can jump back and forth. You know, I, I like to say it's a cobweb. It's not a straight line. So I can tell you like, oh, but, but, but wait, but wait, also this happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And this is how that relates. It's very difficult to, to lay it out in a book in such a way because of all, all these, you know, this, like I said, this tangle of, of cobwebs that, that is all this stuff. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, I find that very, very difficult. And then to explain it in such a way that you're not, you're making it clear, but you're not dumbing it down to the point where it's almost like, you, you know, you're, you're explaining something to a child or something. Right, right, exactly. It's like, how, what, what do people understand? What do I have to, like, actually lay out um, without making it too complicated or, or have, you know, running around 10 blocks to get to the, the, to the yeah. point? Yeah, exactly. And this stuff is so interweaved and so intertangled, and there's there's so much that goes into it. I mean, you look at all the 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 basic stuff that we've been talking about tonight, and now now add in the liminality stuff, add in the trickster element. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, and you try to you know mix all that stuff in, and it just gets so complicated. It's almost more than we can we can quite wrap our brains around yet. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and and I think that's you know that's built into all of this. That's part of it. And and it might it might be like the eyeball trying to see itself, you know, without using a mirror or saying you can't you can't see it exactly. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll know eventually as people figure out more pieces. Uh, we'll see. I don't. I I'm I'm almost to the point where I think we don't get to know. But hey, maybe I'll, I'll be happy if we do. Well, what if somebody? So what if someone actually finds a Bigfoot body? Like it's a legitimate find, you know, it's a, it's a corpse of an unknown primate science gets to, you know, examine it and stuff. Do the paranormal Bigfoot stuff stop at that point? You know, I was thinking, and, and I, I I was saying until recently, I I was saying, in fact, probably the last interview I did, I said, I guess if that happens, I'll have to, you know, eat crow and say I was wrong, but I don't think so. I don't think that stops it because there's still tons of these stories about no no no. but i I don't i don't mean that like i'm saying like like are these paranormal bigfoot stories there because it's such a liminal thing because we don't know if it exists or not but if we knew it exists if we had proof that it exists gotcha would would we no longer get paranormal bigfoot stories it would be something else that the paranormal that that sort of liminality would latch on to gotcha hmm yeah i don't know I don't know at all because at this point, I'm. I, I don't want to say sure, but I'm very, very confident that we're, this is not a, a known or an unknown uh, gorilla or something or a or, or a relic hominid that's prowling around out there. I'm just very, very confident that it's it's something else. It's something other. Right. Right. So, so and- it, it's almost difficult for me to think in that way. But uh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that would happen. Well, I, I, I don't close the door on the idea that there could be an unknown private out there, especially in certain areas, um, and that this phenomena may be mimicking that unknown primate. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fair. But uh, again, this is just, you know, this is, if I have to weigh in, if, if, if I have to bet the house on one way or the other, I'm going to bet that uh, we're not getting a body ever. What what about something like a yeti, you know, out in the Himalayas? You think what, what, what if you had to pick one to exist, would you say that's more likely than the American Bigfoot? Yeah, maybe the the Almasty in Russia cuz you know they've got that vast expanses of taiga where you know maybe there could be some kind of relic hominid just living in there. Um maybe, you know. I mean the Pacific Northwest and Canada are pretty vast is and they and, are not fully uh, covered with people. <laughs> they are. They are. It's it, for me. It comes down to all the research I've done for this book, and you know, the folklore all over the world talks about these wild men and all the different names they give for them. And you know, with the exception of of a very very few uh, Native American tribes, it's, they're almost universally talked of as a supernatural entity. And to sit there and say, you know, especially in the Bigfoot world, when they're, they're very happy, the, the, the flesh and blood Bigfoot folks are very, very happy to use all these uh, Native American names for Bigfoot to prove that 
you know, all these tribes talked about and they knew they were there. But then to dismiss their teachings when they say, but they were spirit beings, you know, they, they were something else. Uh, even if they say they were people, they will say they were people with special powers, you know, mm. and so forth. To dismiss that is very arrogant, you know, uh, to say that, that, you know, they knew what they were looking at when they saw a wolf and everything else. But when they saw this thing, they didn't know what they were looking at. They were just, you know, essentially primitive natives. And how could they know? It's just, you know, superstition when it comes to that. I mean, that's, that's very ignorant. I think people knew exactly what they were looking at. And there's a reason why these things all over the world were said to be, you know, supernatural or, or you know, otherwise, like other. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, I don't disagree with you. I just, like I said, I leave the door open that there is the possibility of a flesh and blood creature out there uh, in certain areas. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's fair. I, I do think it's fair. Just me personally, I'm just I'm kind of leaning further and further away from that as time goes on. <laughs> and you were so in the other camp when I started I, talking. I really to you. was. I was absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that's a very natural progression, though. With yeah, people, yeah. Because it seems less outrageous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it seems less outrageous to be talking about an animal or or a relic hominid than it does to be talking about some you know weird other thing. Yeah, some spirit or something. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, once again, Alba Twitch is when Alba Twitch Day, October twelfth, Saturday, and it starts at eleven a.m. and goes to the 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 sort of festival itself goes to five. But uh, like I said, the ghost walks are later, so you can hang out. And there's food vendors and, you know, paranormal speakers, all kinds of stuff to do all day. It's family friendly. You can bring your kids. And there's a, a walking trail right there. If you want to, you know, you don't have to spend all day at the festival. You can walk up by the river and uh, lots of stuff to do. And it will be a great day. It's Albert Twitch Day is one of my favorite days of the year. It's always a fun time. Columbia, Pennsylvania, October 12th. Okay, Albert, no. Albertwitchday.com is the website. And the one I was there for, I thoroughly enjoyed. So I assume I will enjoy this one as well. Yeah. And I will be there. Gwen will be there. And we're going to try and get some of our other co-hosts out. We'll see if that happens. Coax them out of their holes. <laughs> and uh, so come find us. Say hi. Yeah, I'll have a table there with all my books and stuff. So we'll probably be hanging out there a good bit. And then, like I said, ghost tour at 7 o'clock. That's me. All right. Awesome. And the week after is your, uh, is, uh, what's the name of it? Strange realities. In That's it. Nashville. And there's, I mean, it's me and Josh and the, the, uh, conspiracy normal crew and the, all kinds of other speakers. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. It should be a whole day full of uh, speakers and music. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I'm told someone is bringing a banjo for me to play. Cause I can't, oh, nice. my, my banjo on the plane. If so, this will be the first time in well over a year I've played in front of people. I didn't really? know I was ever going to play in front of people again. So we'll see if it's a banjo I like. Like some banjos I just can't play because I just don't like the, like them. So I'm going to have to be very comfortable if this is going to be my first performance in that song. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I'll play some songs. Nice. All right. Thanks, Tim. People can find you where? Strangefamiliars.com. All right. Our patrons help make this show possible, and I'd like to send an extra special thanks to all patrons pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Super Inframan, Tim, Alex Whitcomb, Nadine, Demian Tallman, Edu Camahort, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sumby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Gaia Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You helped make this show possible. 
Conspiranormal Podcast proudly presents The Strange Realities Conference Strange Realities Come join us for one day of presentations on the paranormal with live music at night featuring Tim Banal The Rise and Fall of the Flat Earth Theory Joshua Kutchin Alien Hybrid Lore Joe Damari Pushing the Limits of Reality Guy Malone Roswell 1947 What Really Happened Timothy Renner Pennsylvania Wild Man And added to the lineup Mark Anthony Wyatt Cornish Legends and UFO Sightings Zach Hunt a Presentation of his book on Rapture Followed by a live recording of the Conspiranormal Podcast More speakers and music acts to be announced October 19, 2019 SIR Nashville Tickets and info at www.strangerealitiesconference.com $40 at the door $30 bucks pre-sale All right, again, come hang out with us at Albatwitch down in Columbia, Pennsylvania. We'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.